So we're going to now discuss viruses in light of <laughs> 2019 and 20 and recent events with uh, COVID-19. It's a very, very appropriate topic. Um, what I want to talk about is the general features of viruses, and then we'll discuss some of the problematic viruses, some of the issues we see, and then we're definitely going to spend a little bit of time on COVID. I'll try to give you the most recent information that I can obtain at this time of putting this recording together. Keep in mind, our knowledge of viruses is a moving target. We're always learning new things, and we do have to keep in mind, viruses are constantly changing. So here's the crazy thing about viruses. We consider viruses non-living, all right? They're, they're lacking some of the key if we want to say ingredients to be considered a living organism. So when we classify viruses, it's they're not going into domains, kingdoms, phylums. Um, we're classifying them based on shape and genetic information. And we'll get to that in a few minutes here. But we typically consider them non-living. So here's something I want you guys to do. Go grab a bottle of Listerine or cleaner, disinfectant, uh, something you use to clean the bathrooms, uh, whatever it is. And if you look at it, it often says kills 99% of bacteria, viruses, and germs. How do you kill something that's not alive? A non-living organism cannot be killed because it's not alive. So the killing 99.9% .9 is a marketing strategy. Oh, it's really effective. It'll kill everything. But again, you're not killing a non-living organism. So because viruses lack, <coughs> excuse me, lack true cellular structure, they lack their own independent metabolism and their own independent reproduction ability, we classify them as non-living. And within the non-living category, we then say, all right, are they active or inactive viruses? Because Viruses aren't always functioning. They have to have a host to be functional. That's the key. So when we talk about vaccinations and immune responses, can we find a way to block the virus from getting into the host? If you do, you now have an immunity to it. That's the amazing thing. And I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into HIV. There are people who are immune to the HIV virus. It cannot attach to their cells and then go into their cells and become an active virus that will infect the host. So molecular geneticists in this class, I would encourage you go into this area of research. There is huge opportunity and need for this. So let's start with the big picture though. What is the general nature of a virus? General properties and features. Close this up. So viruses have some kind of nucleic acid core. It can be DNA or it can be RNA. Some viruses have an RNA genome. HIV has RNA. It's known as a retrovirus. So we need to understand what is the genetic makeup of the virus <clears throat> if we're going to figure out how to develop a vaccination against the virus. Viruses in general have some kind of protein coat that surrounds them. Often we'll refer to this as the capsid. And then on top of that, they often will have an envelope that surrounds the capsid. Let me move this guy over. That's, by the way, a one of the uh, bacteriophage viruses. They look like little rocket ships. Uh, and we'll talk about that viral structure in a moment here. And then the fourth key piece of information, or if we want to call it fourth key structure we want to understand about viruses, are the recognition proteins. Because that is what they use to infect 
the host or to recognize a host the, to then be able to infect them. So in this retrovirus, those are, let me get the drawing, little pen here. Those are what they're calling the tail fibers. These little proteins here are what will identify the proteins on the host cell and tell the virus you can attach here. If you can't, it's like a lock and key. If you don't have the right key, you can't attach to that lock or get into that lock. It's not going to do you any good. So, all right. So looking at viruses, <clears throat> we will see that viruses in general are species specific. Uh, let me put that property here. I'm going to change font a little bit. Um, so there's what we call species specific, but they have a host range. So like many viruses will infect bats, bats, birds, reptiles. They all carry lots of viruses. Those viruses sometimes don't impact them. Birds have tons of viruses. It doesn't harm the virus. The bird is just a carrier. But then that virus jumps from that species to another and then can become problematic. <clears throat> so often, again, we see viruses that are species, fairly species specific. They'll infect one species or a small selective group of species, um, what we call the host range. But in other species, they don't have any impact. But what we are seeing are viruses that are, as I say, jumping the species barrier. They're actually evolving the ability to infect other hosts. And that's where it gets really, really scary. Uh, within a host, within a species that the virus infects, sometimes we see a thing called tissue trophism. This is where the viruses will infect selective tissues within the host. So to get even more specific. So they may not infect your muscle. It might only be your neural tissue or your lymphatic tissue or certain tissues that those viruses go after. So again, knowing these pieces of information about the viruses is critical to being able to live with viruses. <clears throat> and something to mention, there are some good things about viruses. We'll talk about that later when we get into what we can do with viruses and biotechnology and genetic engineering and all those things. So, all right. Viruses have two primary viral shapes. The one you're looking at here is known as a helical shape. Kind of looks like a rod or this tubular shape, hollow tube. Um, <clears throat> generally, and I'm not going to give you absolutes with many of these things, but generally this shape, the helical capsid, is associated with plant viruses. That is a general trend we see when discussing viruses. Those viruses tend not to infect animals. They don't have the right recognition proteins to infect the animals. Uh, the ones that infect the animals tend to have this shape, <clears throat> what we call the icosahedral capsid. It looks like, I don't know, I kind of think it's somewhat like a soccer ball. It's got these little 20 little triangular facets or facets on it. So there's one, here's two, number three and so on. So if you went around 360 degrees, you'd see 20. Um, so the capsid's made up of these 20 little triangles. Those are the recognition proteins right there, and then the genome genetic material inside here. So typically animal viruses, we generically can call them adenoviruses, have an icosahedral capsid. So again, remember this. This is gonna be an important one. Let me go back here. This tends to be plant-based. This tends to be animal. And again, I apologize for the writing. It's not easy to write with a mouse. 
So we got plant, animal. Bacteria. Bacteria also get viral infections, believe it or not. So when we look at bacteria, the viral shape tends to have both the icosahedral and the helical shape. It combines them, combines both those shapes. So the head right there is icosahedral. The tail right there is helical. So you stack these two together, you give them some of these recognition proteins, and go after the bacteria. So these little rocket ship viruses tend to be bacterial viruses, or we call them a bacterial phage. Phage just means viral particle or virus. So viral genomes, again, I just want to emphasize this again, DNA or RNA, and they tend to be host specific. So just trying to reemphasize that concept when we're discussing viruses. So not all viruses are bad things for us. We don't have to worry about every virus out there. There are some for sure we need to worry about that. You go, Ugh. others, don't worry, it's never going to get you. The ones we concern ourselves with or should concern ourselves with are the ones that can jump the barrier and go from one species to the next. <laughs> um, when we're looking at the viral genome, uh, what we often notice, let me give us some more room here. Nah, you guys know what it says. I'm just going to clear it out. Okay, so the viral genome, when we're looking at that, we we'll often see that it is either single or double-stranded. Could be DNA or RNA based on the genome. And when it goes through replication, it's pretty error-prone. This leads to a high mutation rate. So, bing, 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 bing. You know what that means? Viruses often have a rapid evolution. All right? They can change and evolve quickly. That is the tough part about viruses, is that those suckers don't play by the normal rules, and they can change and evolve on us and next thing you know, you're like, oh, not good. So uh, everything's off balance here. Sorry about that. But I definitely wanted to make sure you guys get these key points about viruses. So we'll be talking about this throughout the lecture, and especially when, especially when we get into discussing specific viruses, we need to remember these things and understand this is why vaccinations are so important. They help minimize viral evolution. If we don't vaccinate, we don't develop the immune system, viruses keep running rampant through the population, they continue to evolve, and we'll never win the game against viruses. So we have to figure out how to beat their, if we want to call it, their viral offense with a good, solid defense. So, all right, just briefly, Hit this thing again. This is the influenza virus. This is a sucker that's rolling around every year that gives us the flu. It's got that shape that we were talking about, the helical shape um, within the envelope there. Uh, the problem are, or problem is these little attachment proteins or recognition proteins. They call them the antigens. That's what they use to bump up against us, and our immune system sees it and recognizes it and then tries to destroy it. Oh. All right, the... There it is. The uh, bacteriophage. Oh, phage. Mentioned that earlier. Got the basic idea. This is an actual image of a bacterial phage. 
what they actually look like. Um, I said, capsid head, the uh, tubular body there. Uh, just very, very complex structure. So key is if we can disrupt that structure, the virus becomes inactive and it does not have the ability to function. So across the spectrum of viruses, there's a huge diversity in size and shape. So you kind of look at, here's a general spectrum of viruses as well as bacteria, eukaryotic cell. There's a big spectrum here. Um, so here's our typical influenza virus right there. There's our HIV virus over here, rabies, herpes, pox, etc. Here's the bacteria E. coli. So you think about it, these are bacteriophages, these little guys here, that are actually infecting a bacterial cell. That bacterial cell is small enough to fit inside the human cell. So when we discuss things like, ooh, do I have a filter on my furnace? Um, is your filter capable of blocking viral particles or trapping them? That's a pretty impressive filter. Or if you're filtering water, trying to purify water, does the water have a filter that enables it to trap the viral particles? So things to think about. Are those products being sold truly living up to their promise? Ask those questions. Because why spend all that money on something and it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do? So, all right. So we got a basic idea of size and shape and how viruses work or vi what viruses look like. Now what I want to do is talk about viral replication. And this is one of the reasons why viruses are not considered living. They don't reproduce on their own. They have to have a host cell. That is one of the requirements. Viruses require hosts in order for viral, viral reproduction to occur. If you take away the host, viruses can't do anything. If you block the entry of the virus into the host, virus can't do anything. So viruses have two reproductive cycles. One is known as lytic, the other one is lysogenic. What we're gonna do is walk through the steps and look at what happens in each, what are the steps for each of the cycles, the pros and cons if we're associating ourselves or if we're putting this association with one of these viruses, um, how's that gonna impact us? So, all right, so let me reduce this and let's, Take a look at viral replication here. Let's start with this. Okay, so number one in your favorite things to do if you're a virus is to get this organized here. First step, ah, let me increase the font so it's a little easier to see. First step in viral replication is host. Identification and attachment. Yep, teens. This is achieved through those receptor proteins. So, you, you a virus hits you. If the virus doesn't hit you, you don't have to worry about it. But if the virus touches you, it is trying to identify, is this the correct host? So the whole point with COVID-19 of wearing a mask is so you don't spray potential viral particles out and those attach to another host, another person. Because if you have COVID, even if you're not showing symptoms, you cough, you sneeze, you breathe out, the viral particles are going to spray out. And if they touch another host, they will attach. So now you cough or sneeze or talk or laugh or sing, 
in the presence of somebody else who is not wearing a mask as well. Viral particles attached to their face. They've touched it with their hands. Now it's in their their sign, their nose. It's in their eyes, etc. They breathe it in. It goes into their lungs, and the attachment happens. All right. So the second step. It's already identified the host. Now the virus penetrates the host. Penetration. Some viruses will just insert the genome. So the genome's inserted. Other viruses, the entire virus will go into the host. It just depends on the virus and the host. So they're either injecting their genome into the host cell or the entire virus is going into the host cell. So again, just depends here. So back here, here's the attachment, the injection of the viral genome here into the host cell. Now the viral genome is inside the host cell. This is where we can see two options occurring. This way or this way? Oh, I'm going to put that one up. This will depend upon what type of virus you're working with. If the virus is going to use the lytic cycle, this is where it will go a slightly different route than if the virus was using the lysogenic cycle. So within the lytic cycle, what the virus will do here is the third, oh, I don't need that. The third step, which is synthesis. It's going to take over the host cell and oh, replicate the viral genome. So it just depends, like, okay, I need to make more viral particles. I'm going to use your ribosomes, your Golgi's, your vesicles, all your structures and I'm going to make new viral genomes and viral product products, structures, etc. Once the virus has replicated the genome, it's basically going to build <clears throat> new viruses using the host machinery. That's really sucky. Actually, that's, let's make that step four. Come on. Well, sorry. Not playing nicely here. All right, so the fourth step here is to assemble or build new viral particles. So let's go to 20 there. Okay, so we built new viral particles. And then the fifth step. They're releasing the new viruses. So the cell ruptures and new viruses get shot out. So that's what we're seeing happen here with this, <clears throat> this step of the viral life cycle. These guys are known as virulent viruses. Bad viruses. So, all right. In the next part of the lecture, I'll talk about lysogenic.